All right, so I think that kind of takes us into some other things related to the home. You know, we've got battery technology that we're first and foremost familiar with uh, in cars. So, you know, in the beginning, um, my first experiences were about um, the use of cobalt as a chemistry company I did a bunch of work for, said no cobalt. Uh, it was this terrible word, and it was synonymous with danger and risk, and we shall not have that in our cars. And then Tesla came along and made cobalt work, and everyone said, hey, wait a minute, they can't do that. And, oh, wait, they did. Maybe we should do that <laughs> too. And now, yeah, we've got lots of cobalt, but it's kind of become the new blood diamond, so we're looking to get away from that. And there's a lot of different technologies that are candidates to replace it. We read a lot about LFP, now more recently sodium ion, uh, the redox flow systems, um, lithium sulfur. Uh, NASA's got this new greatest thing since sliced bread, uh, a selenium sulfur battery. And yeah, it doesn't seem like uh, a day goes by without reading about some new innovation in batteries. So we are focused first on getting the range and the performance that we need from our cars, but it directly applies to our home and what we might be trying to do to provide a backup to the rather frail power grid we have and or doing our part to help bolster that power grid. So, you know, all the acronyms, NCM, <laughs> LFP, yeah. XYZ. Yeah. yeah, there's no shortage of alphabet suit out there. You know, which are your favorites? Where do you see this going? You've, you've probably spent more time researching it than I could ever even imagine having for myself. So <laughs> interested in there's, what you say. My, well, the one thing I always say whenever I talk about batteries in any of the videos I produce is always there's no one chemistry to rule them all. There's going to be multiple winners in the future in the next five ten years because uh, it all depends on use cases like a battery that might work extremely well for vehicles or airplanes because it's super energy dense and lightweight might the cost might be too expensive or may, and not make sense for use in your home so it's it doesn't mean that there's going to be one thing to do across the board but when you're looking at all the acronyms and the the, <laughs> the battery soup uh the ones that jump out at me are the tried and true lfp it's like it that that battery is already here. It's great. It's fantastic, especially for home use. But for the future, it's like the sodium ion is one that I'm keenly interested in because it's a material that's readily available. It's cheap. And so it's like long term, it seems like the smart play to go down that path. Um, there's a lot of potential there. But there's also uh, like lithium sulfur is one that's caught my eye over the past year or two. Um, Sulfur has a whole lot of problems in batteries, but those problems are slowly getting kind of chipped away. And as they get chipped away, there's a lot of technologies that are starting to kind of form around that that look really impressive. Um, that hopefully they pan out. <laughs> uh, it's a little too early to say at this point, but it looks promising. Um, there's another technology, uh, niobium. Do you know much about the niobium no, chemistries? No, tell me. Uh, there's a company... Yeah, there's a company called Battery Streak that is creating niobium batteries. Now, niobium is a, a little more of expensive material when you're looking at the current prices. But what that battery can do is just kind of astonishing. It can, like, fast charge in minutes. It can take a pounding on charge-discharge cycles and have virtually no degradation. And it can last for <laughs> essentially forever. An astonishing battery. Of course, it's going to be very expensive to start out, which is why Battery Streak is currently, at the moment, they've partnered with the military, and they're working with the military on creating energy storage solutions for them, which makes sense. Military has deep pockets. They want a battery that's literally bulletproof and can last for years and be really robust. So it's like I'm kind of keeping my eye on that one because if they can kind of get past that it's kind of expensive upfront territory and get the cost down it's a very appealing uh, looking battery to me uh, so i'm keeping an eye on that one as well oh that sounds good again more info for tom i love to uh, walk away with subjects <laughs> i want to research so um you know you mentioned the sodium ion that one has particularly caught my attention uh, one of the things that i've read about it that is really appealing to me from having 
I've had to deal with what are the hazardous goods that are lithium ion batteries as you try to ship them. And the awkwardness about that, the extraordinary packaging requirements, the hazardous goods hauling permits that are required for the transporters, etc. But sodium ion apparently has the ability to be discharged down to a zero volt state of charge, where mm -hmm. most of our um, subscribers here are probably familiar with the fact that when you get to zero percent state of charge on a, a lithium ion battery, it is by no means zero volts. And it's still very much a shock hazard and an arc flash hazard and things like that. But if I could discharge it all the way to zero, ship it and then charge it back up again, that'd be wonderful. Uh, but there's another mm -hmm. aspect of it um, that I find really intriguing. And um, I noticed that you had done a, a, a session on this at one point or another. I didn't watch the session, so, you know, um, no spoiler alert here for me. Um, but wood for batteries. Um, yeah. Making hard carbon from, you know, byproducts of the paper pulp industry. It's really intriguing. But you can't just replace the graphite in our cells with that, except for in sodium ion, where there's a little bit more hope being able to use hard carbon. So... What are your thoughts about that? Are we going to be able to tap into what is, in my mind, an impending graphite shortage and be able to utilize some, uh, you know, some wood materials in, in place of it? And uh, how soon? What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I do. But this also comes back to I don't know how widespread it's going to be because there's a couple of companies that I looked into that are doing this now. Uh, Stora Enzo and uh, there's another one, Lignode, I think is what they call themselves both Swedish companies, and they're doing this already. So they're already in pilot testing and already have uh, batteries out there that are being used. Um, it's a very impressive path, um, but the energy density on these batteries is really low compared to what you see on an MC, NMC or LFP battery, like by an order of magnitude, like it's seven times less energy dense. So it's not something you'd see in a car battery or, or even like home energy storage at this point. It'd probably be more appropriate for like Internet of Things or like smaller use cases. Um, but it is something that's still early days and it shows that there is a path there to use uh, the, the lignin that's kind of part of the, the paper making manufacturing process. There's like waste material that comes out of making paper that one of these companies is actually taking that waste material and turning it into this product. So it's it's one of those finding closed loops and different ways to reuse different materials that we've previously looked at as kind of garbage is potentially a great path for energy storage just like this. So it, it definitely, it's going to be something that we're going to see in the future. I still just have a giant question mark about like where exactly we're going to see it. Yeah, well... My own research into that kind of showed what you said there, that the energy density doesn't look very good. But it can potentially mix with the normal graphite material that we, we tend to use more often in lithium ion batteries, um, what is commonly used in even the newest sodium ion. But there is some hope that you won't have to have this particular uh, structure that is the ideal graphite material, and we can use other forms of carbon. Um, but as a mix, right, you use a 50-50 mix of graphite and um, the uh, hard carbon from wood or, you know, there's lots of other materials too. Uh, coconuts are, you know, common material for hard carbon, um, lots of organic uh, sources for that material. So, you know, the point that I wonder about is more about what is an impending graphite shortage you know, a lot of people are worried about lithium, a lot of people are worried about cobalt, a lot of people are worried about nickel, not many people are worried about graphite, and I am. So I see, you know, lignin as a potential offset to that, and it's more or better suited, I would say, to some of the chemistries than others. So I look forward to that being part of our all of the above solution to our, our energy storage needs of the future. So... Um, um, you know, I assume that you have invested in some battery technology for your home. Are these Tesla power walls or what would you get? <laughs> in my previous house, I had Tesla power walls. In my new house, I'm getting the end phase uh, battery system, which are LFP batteries. Ah, nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you like the LFP, obviously not for its energy density, um, but for no. its safety. What, what What's the attribute you it's, like about it? 
What I like about LFP over an MC or something like that is it's safer um, and it has a longer cycle life than uh, NMC does. So it's a little more of a robust, safer battery. And when you're putting a battery into your house, it's like you want something that's not gonna potentially <laughs> catch fire or have issues of any of any kind. So LFP is like the safest kind of technology we have at the moment, which is what drew me to it. Yeah, good call. So uh, yeah, the graphite shortage, we're going to find more use of alternate materials all different sorts of battery chemistries that are coming. Um, one of the ones you did do uh, a session on, again, I didn't watch it, uh, but the redox flow battery and how it kind of went to oh, yeah. China. Um, you know, is it too late to recall that and put it into use over here? Uh, you know, what what are your thoughts on that one? That one, when you first read about it, it's kind of a, you know, a, an eye roller at first, but then when you dig into it and you think, wow, that's really something. So what, what were your likes about the redox flow? Um, and uh, oh, it's, what should we do with it? it? It's very similar to the LFP thing. It's, it's a battery that's incredibly safe. It's very robust. It will last for potentially decades. Um, speaking of that, that America kind of lost its patent and gave it away to China for that specific chemistry. Um, they're trying to get that back and there's an American company that has that chemistry and they're put, they're going to be putting out a, basically a Tesla Powerwall competitor that is this flow battery that would be like the size of a small refrigerator that you could put outside your house and it would be a 40 kilowatt hour battery, which is massive for, and be more than enough for an average house. Um, it's the equivalent of, what is that? Like three Tesla Powerwalls or so would be That's one of these right. units. Yeah, and this unit would last you 30 years. <laughs> it's like it, it, the cycle life would just outstrip anything a Powerwall could do. Um, and they claim that the cost is going to be price competitive to a Tesla Powerwall. So if they can get that price as low as they claim it is, here's this technology that is long lifespan. You buy it once and you literally just forget about it. It just kind of runs in the background. You don't even think about it. So for me, Re Redox Flow is another technology that's just extremely exciting. Um, but it's but it comes down to patents and it comes down to can they get the cost down can they can they actually do what they say they're going to be able to do uh, so for me those are the big questions yeah and then i'll add another one to that and you know it's a little bit like tesla as competition to other major auto, automotive oems you know oh they're so expensive we can build a cheap car and maybe you know eat their lunch and just yeah. about the time they get to the point where they do that, guess what Tesla does? They lower their <laughs> price. Oh, hey, yeah, we made our money on these cars. It's all right. We can lower the price below theirs. And, yeah, well, they do the same thing with their power wall once the uh, the flow battery hits. So, uh, you know. Yep. Uh, you know, we should never underestimate what they can do with volume and scale. So, 